Hello everyone and welcome back um, after your afternoon tea. I've got a couple of challenges today. The first is to keep you all on your toes with questions ready. It's the end of the day for us, an end of a fascinating day with lots of ideas. We have no, no in-room speakers for this session, so all of our speakers are remote, and at least some of them are starting off to, with this morning. In Germany, they at 8 o'clock this morning, and our, and our, our European speakers are starting off their day fresh. So I'd like first to introduce Beth Fulton, who's online. I don't know if you can see her behind me. Hi, Beth. How are you going? I, I have the benefit of, of knowing Beth, so I don't even need to read the notes. Beth is a researcher in our marine and atmospheric research for CSIRO. Beth has the remarkable skill of somebody who can traverse uh, the deep process numerical modelling through to uh, talking to stakeholders from fishermen through to policy makers through to greenies and somehow manages to make her really complex world of science very accessible to people uh, through her use of language and the way that she actually presents her science and creates fora and, and uh, methods for people to interact with her and her work. So with no further ado, Beth, I'll hand over to you to uh, show us what you got. Great, thanks. It's a real pity I couldn't be with you. Oh, it sounds like it was a really exciting meeting to be at, so I'm a little bit sad I'm stuck in freezing Hobart, but we'll get on with it. The, um, I'm really thankful that you've given me the opportunity to speak today. I actually represent quite a large group of researchers here in CSIRO who are looking at the um, how complexity science can actually be applied in action. So if you put yourself in the place of a, uh, a marine manager, particularly say on the Western Australian coast, you might think you're looking at a beach, but the processes actually add up far beyond that to be the entire coastline up to the whole ocean basin. So what they're dealing with is processes that they think of on a couple of metres to hundreds of kilometres, so the Ningaloo management scales that you can see listed there. But what they're really dealing with are processes from the, the microbe scale all the way up to ocean basin. So when we go to approach that, to model that, we need to integrate all those different processes and influences to give them informative decision support in how they actually manage those systems. So effectively on a day-to-day -day basis, these guys are having to grapple with complex systems. And it's not just in a single area, it's across all the different pressures on marine ecosystems, so how those different areas are used, but also the influence of the land onto the sea and vice versa. So there's a huge information jigsaw puzzle that they have to put together and make informed decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. What has historically happened is that you get quite a lot of focus on the one little area, the one little area of concern. They don't think about other people pushing similar rocks or the same rock uphill. And they often don't think about how they can be acting against each other. So the complex interactions mean they're actually defeating their purposes. So they need some experience and some help in dealing with that situation. Two great examples are actually in the northwest of Australia. About 25% of Australia's exports come from this region. But they're also areas of immense natural beauty where there's world heritage areas. Uh, a lot of recreational fishermen and other people go visiting up there, about 200,000 a year, go to visit Ningaloo Reef, which is the world's longest uh, fringing reef. So just as we're famous for the Great Barrier Reef, the Ningaloo Reef isn't as, as well known. But it's very close to shore. It's only a couple of metres from shore to a kilometre, so it's very accessible. That does mean this complex system, though, is quite closely influenced by what happens on land. So people need to that are trying to manage that area need to get their head around complex systems. What's grown up through time and recommendations over the last 20 years is a process called ecosystem-based management. So the fear from the different user groups is that this will end up as a layer cake where everybody has to worry about everybody else. But just by adding on regulations instead of trying to integrate and think about it as a whole. And ultimately, in a way, that slowed the process quite a lot. But it's also meant that current decisions or past decisions and even future decisions aren't as responsive as, and proactive as they need to be. So part of this problem is because the mental model that people use around decision-making processes are very linear. They think there's a problem. 
they make their decision and they assume that those results will just miraculously turn up, that they'll have hit it spot on. Unfortunately, that might have been true back on the savannah when we were just thinking about how to dodge the next lion. Unfortunately, when you get into places where there's multiple drivers, uh, environmental or social, where there's different groups of people with different objectives, they can all interact with each other and they actually potentially undermine uh, each other's actions and they certainly don't lead to the anticipated outcomes. You get a lot of unintended consequences. For instance, if you look at the world's fisheries and the problems that have occurred with those over the last hundred years, the vast majority of those have been because people weren't, didn't realise they were dealing with a complex system. And so they had a few problems that my son is having as he learns to drive. So basically it's about misjudging feedback. People who aren't experienced with complex systems either don't push hard enough, they understeer an effect, they, they think they'll get more response than they really do because they haven't taken into account how other components of the ecosystem or components of the system will push back and so they need to put a, a lot more pressure to see the hope for change. Or on the flip side, they think they're going to need a lot of pressure and they haven't taken into account positive feedbacks which means that they get oversteer and they get far too much response. Both of those can be quite a, a dangerous thing, so to speak, when you're dealing with large marine ecosystems worth billions of dollars. So what these people need is actually some help training their brain. So we've had quite a lot of success, particularly Fabio, Fabio's work, where uh, we've looked at how people, how well people make decisions about complex systems if they haven't had a lot of experience really thinking about them before. And so nobody can perfectly predict a complex system. You can get a lot better at it with experience though. So we found a three to 10 times increase in their ability to deal with complex systems with the kind of training that we help them go through with the, the model world. And the key part about that is just learning about that understeer and the oversteer and about how the system can respond in unintended ways. So that not only gives them a better set of skills in their day-to-day decision-making, it means that they're a more informed audience who can ask more insightful questions when we get to using the tools with them. So there's a couple of key steps in that process. The first is that it has to be a very participatory approach. So the sort of classical science approach of you have a problem, you go away, you find a solution and you bring it back, really doesn't work in complex systems, particularly along the coastline. It has to be a participatory co-evolution of the ideas, both because there's many sources of information you can't access any other way, like how they make their decisions, the anecdotal evidence, the indigenous uh, knowledge of the system that's just not written down anywhere, but also it's the sparking off. It's actually the interacting complexity of the research group and the interest groups themselves that comes out with the viable solutions. I've yet to actually be in a case where the solution that came out in the end was one that a single individual group or person had thought up in isolation. It's really critical in that interaction. And then the real, the, the key role around complexity science is all the different aspects of it actually come together. So I can't swear to this having been a systematic sit down and really target the bits of complexity science that help, but this has been ad hoc evolution over the last decade, that there really are pretty much every aspect of complexity science that feeds in to this work in one way or other, uh, either on the data side and the understanding side around patterns and the non-linearities, through to the modelling and projection side with the networks and the, and the different kinds of models, both systems and agent-based. And we do that through a toolbox approach. So every one of these kind of models that I'll briefly um, paint out for you actually has a specific use and is useful in its own right, but that as a set they can give you a much more complete answer and understanding and actually that greater learning. So it's been a lot, for a long time it's been the modeler who's been the person who learns most about the system and this is a way of taking that learning to a much broader audience. So the basic premise behind this is to consider all parts of the system, not just the natural world or not just the economy, that we've seen in the past, but actually to have a touch across that whole entire way of thinking about marine systems. So part of that, the starting point is around qualitative models. So you, 
typically draw these up with people who live in the system or understand the system. And they're really just descriptive models, but you can do some algebra, some matrix algebra around that. And basically what you can learn is if you press on one part of the system, what other parts of the system will pop up. And for many people, that's all they need to know. That can be an endpoint in itself. So for the empirical side of things, that information is itself really critical. There's regulatory bodies and processes that are set up for certain kinds of information already. And trying to feed complex information into those is a very hard, a hard battle to have. So by using these empirical models, it's actually a good way of getting in that system's thinking but into that existing regulatory mindset, regulatory process, so that you keep them engaged and answering specific questions as they go along, but they're starting to get more of that system's flavour. The next one's potentially the most controversial amongst the academic world. They don't like the use of the word toy. But in reality, these are the models that we learn the most from. People learn the most when they're willing to play, when they're willing to fiddle. And these are tools that are simple, stripped down models at a level to help people literally play with them. So these are not necessarily scientists, they're quite often people from the real world who get in and they pull levers and press buttons and try to see what that Lego world looks like. And through doing that, they not only get a better sense of how complex systems work, that might be their system or another system, it really does seem to re-educate the brain to think about complex systems. But it's a two-way street. We get lots of information on how they make their decisions too. And that's when we start to get into some more complete system models. So the first type of those are, are sort of thinned down system models, capturing just the key components of the system. And the reason we've gone that route is you can apply the same kind of rigorous statistical methods that the regulatory people are most useful and are most used to. And so you can start to bridge the divide. You can shuffle ideas backwards and forwards between the kind of single sector and, and small scale questions that we're used to up to that big system picture. If you think of it like a bunch of taking all the world's most famous painters of all the different kinds together to a single location and saying, I want this picture painted for me, you get lots of different views and perspectives, but you can layer that up to get a complete vision of how people see that system running. And that's when you get into the full system model. But it's not about trying to deal with the system in one particular way. There's lots of different ways of building that system together so that you get the best representation of each part. So the different models have different options. I'm not sure this slide's come across completely well in the different places, but basically the different models have their different uses as well as you go through a system and you understand it. So just to give you a quick taste of what one of those applications might look like, Australia's biggest fishery by area is the southeast scale fish and shark fishery. It's a multi-everything fishery. It catches hundreds of different species from subtropical to subpolar. It uses lots of different kinds of fishing gear, different sized boats, people from different sort of walks of life. In the year 2000 or thereabouts, they realised that economically it was not in a very good position. It was not being particularly profitable. A lot of the fish stocks looked like they were in danger and it was socially in a bad spot as well. So everybody recognised they need solutions. The key was that they needed solutions that were the most cost effective means because Australia's fisheries and a lot of the resource sectors are actually cost recovery. So any dollars to be spent on management have to come from the licence fees to do with that fishery. So we, it was one of the earlier attempts of this kind of work, so it's a bit more um, it doesn't have all the different kinds of models we've just heard about, but it does give you a bit of an idea. So the first part was around building qualitative models uh, based on expert opinion. These people had over 100 years worth of experience in this fishery cumulatively. And the way that they really took this forward was not just by identifying the connections in the system, but by painting scenarios in a systematic sense. So they didn't use a quantitative model, but they did keep themselves honest, so to speak, by saying for each relationship they identified by drawing a little squiggle plot, literally on a piece of paper, about how they thought those things connected so that they could paint substantiated stories around those to get an idea of how the system might change into the future. And then I used a quantitative systems model in parallel to this to see how the different scenarios would pan out. So they tried many, many different scenarios, but I'll just focus on four here. 
one which was the management in place at the time, back in 2006, one which was the sort of the proposed and advocated solution of the time, which was to put the existing management framework got onto every species in the system. Another one that was driven by the conservation movement, which turned the idea of uh, the ocean on its head instead of, instead of being mainly open to fishing with a few closed areas, they were going to close about 85% of the ocean and just leave small paddocks open for fishing. And then there was one that was called the blue skies. It was so different to anything in place that it was never really seriously thought at the time that it would ever be picked up. And in, that was approached in a systems, complexity systems way, so that they picked up each objective and they said, what kind of management would actually address that and how can we interlink it to get the most effective outcomes? So looking at how that panned out, they basically, on the left-hand side of here, we have the qualitative analysis. So the closer to the edge of those spider diagrams, the more effective that uh, objective was met. There were many objectives, but I've boiled them down here. And on the right-hand side, we have the quantitative results. So both of them found that the management in 2006 was not going to deliver well from the target species that was shrinking away from the boundary. Um, and in, interestingly enough, the, uh, the quantitative model said it was actually going to do worse for the industry than the experts had anticipated, but that psychologically the fishermen were at ease with that. They knew how to game that system, they knew how to explore that system, so they were certain about it. If they'd moved into a regime where the quanti quota cap and trade uh, management of fisheries was taken to a broader level, the experts thought that would solve their ecological problems, where the quantitative systems model suggested that it wouldn't. Interestingly enough, the systems model also pointed out that the fishermen were very, would potentially be very uneasy with that situation. There was a lot less certainty year to year about how that would pan out. With, in regard to the conservation proposal, there was a lot of heated debate amongst the experts in the room about how that would pan out. Ultimately, though, in the very long term, they thought that, yes, the target species would recover and that, in turn, all the other objectives would then fall into place. In contrast, the quantitative model said, yes, some of your objectives will be met, but actually the industry wouldn't be economically viable, that it wouldn't be able to cover all its costs, so ultimately that approach would fail as well. Interestingly enough, it was the integrated systems-based, complexity systems-oriented approach that it didn't come out as best in any one particular objective. Anything that was targeted for that objective could do better. But across all the different objectives, it consistently came out second. And so it um, started conversations within the fishermen even before the project was finished. They took that learning back and it's been an interesting evolution ever since. So initially, the experts thought that the quota management would be the way to go. But what we found with the systems approach and that complexity of interactions and networks coming back in was that you had to actually take that complexity knowledge forward and target your objectives with a bunch of different levers um, so that all the objectives were met. And similarly, in the coastal zone, you're going to have a similar kind of outcome. So what that ultimately led to was a $220 million restructuring restructure of the fishery, Australia's federal fisheries, that identified and dealt with those trade-offs. It was concerned about the short-term cost versus the long-term payoff that's going to be devilish with a lot of natural resource management and climate. But what this fisheries example shows that if complexity science is used well, you can actually see a complexity-based response in the fishermen and other users as well. So a threshold point was reached and they took it further. So what was a blue skies option in 2006 by 2008 was largely how the fishery was actually managed. So integrated adaptive management of that form appears to be the only kind of management that will successfully take Australia's marine systems through under climate change. Um, it does recognise the fact that those systems are complex systems. It's requiring a toolbox to deal with the uncertainty, but if that toolbox is used well, it can be transformative. It has largely focused on the biophysical and industry in the past, but it's shifting into the social side as well, and it has the transdisciplinary part of it as key. So while so complexity science in itself has been built up around potentially bits developing in isolation, if we now take a systems approach to complexity system in itself, 
we can build those integrated packages that will help people make much better and more informed decision making into the future. Thanks. Thanks very much, Beth, and uh, not only was the content great, but you were within 30 seconds of your time. <laughs> well done. I'd like to first throw to our international audience, uh, welcome to the discussion, and I'm not sure whether anyone's uh, got some questions through our moderator. Robin's our moderator here, and I guess the idea, the idea is that in the co-conference in Germany, if you've got questions to ask, please do so through calling the microphone to you. If you're online or you're in one of the other online audience places, please send your questions in and they'll be relayed to me. And I guess, Robin, you'll um, throw to me when there's a question. Okay, so have we got any questions here that we could start with? Over on the side, please remember to say who you are and uh, any question. Hello, I'm Pelly Cannon. I'm actually from the Fisheries Research and Development Corporation. Um, I'm really interested in the idea of um, this kind of thing being translatable, so it'll being used in other areas. So I'm interested to know if there's been any interest, Beth, from different kinds of systems, like agricultural systems or other kinds of organisations in the work that you've been doing? So in the sense, yes it is transferable, it's very transferable. It hasn't been picked up so much in the terrestrial world, that's only just beginning. Um, it is beginning to be picked up in the coastal zone, so that area of land-sea interface, so places like the Ningaloo, the Northern Gascoigne, all of the different sectors have got together as around that kind of question setting. There isn't the experience with the kind of regulatory change that we've seen in fisheries in the past, just because it's a newer concept. There's a lot more learning to go around it. And the jurisdictional division is a lot more complicated in the coastal zone. But the potential is there for it's the method is equally applicable anywhere. It is starting to be picked up in places like forestry as well, so it can go further, but you're right to say that fisheries, particularly the work supported by FERDIC, has actually seen this move the furthest ahead anywhere in the world. Uh, have we got any more questions here? Mm -hmm. We've got one down the front. We're just getting the microphone to him, Beth. Hello, I'm Gary Bullis from the Defence Science and Technology Organisation. Um, Beth, it was very interesting to hear uh, a discussion of how um, a complex system could, and research into a complex system could actually impact the decision and the policy w that was developed. What I'm interested in is you talked about bringing people up to speed and getting them trained and experienced, and uh, could you say something about that and how long that um, took to do? So in the work that I've done, it typically takes a, a few couple of day sessions for them just literally playing the things. But we've actually seen even in a half day session, people's ability to think about complex systems start to shift. The reason that you need the repeat is just to reinforce it, like as with any learning. Um, Fabio's actually worked a bit with people from DSTO about having a look at how fast people can do it. And we've actually found one of the key parts is to have a pair, not just to play by yourself, but to play along with someone else who's prodding you as to why you've made those changes. And that doesn't have to be someone who's already experienced with a complex system, it can be another person at the same stage, but just them making you think and make those mental connections about why you've responded the way that you have and how that shifting seems to reinforce that learning process. Thanks very much, Beth. Have we got any more questions? Yep. Have we got any online questions or any other uh, the co-conference folk wanting to? No? Oh, well, there's a microphone dispute. <laughs> Go with it. Uh, my name is Naim Khan. I work for the Department of Immigration and Citizenship. But my question to you is about the quantitative and qualitative methodologies in your integrated approach. Uh, do you integrate the, both the qualitative and quantitative models or you take the results from each and other and just use them separately? So it depends on which researcher directly asking about. In the case of the fisheries example, they happened in parallel, so it's a way of almost checking for uncertainty in the different methods. 
Um, in the case of some of the coastal research we've done, they actually built on each other and it was a progressive interactive response with some of the faster qualitative methods getting information to the modelers and back out again much more rapidly than waiting for the typical model turnaround. And it allowed people to explore quite quickly how the system parts fitted together and it kept it, it was, people were less afraid if it was a qualitative model. A lot of the general public and indigenous population shy away as soon as they hear the word maths, but if they see it's just scribbling on bits of paper, they, they're a lot more comfortable with that at the start. You can ease them in to the process of the fact that they can be modellers too. Thanks very much. Do you think we can uh, either finish that question off, we've got about a minute remaining, uh, maybe ask somebody else a quick question and a quick answer back from you, Beth, and then we'll need to close this session off. Thanks very much for the question and perhaps you could follow up with Beth directly if you haven't quite finished that line of conversation. Uh, Beth, hi, Mark Edwards from UWA here. I've got a question about the use of the term complexity, which um, I'm not too sure how you're imagining complexity or, or defining it. I know with, with natural systems are always more complex before um, you know, human industrial systems or, or whatever move into them. But it seems you're using a different understanding of what complexity is, that complexity is something with human industrial and activities or um, um, you know, mining or fishing or whatever it might be. And I'm thinking about the Great Barrier Reef and the, the push to you know, Swiss cheese the, the, the marine parks up there because of exploration and so forth. And I'm wondering if, if um, the complexity aspect that you're dealing with is at odds with the actual natural complexity of, of the natural systems, the natural marine systems there. I'm using the sense of complexity of non-linear dynamics and interactions and the feedback and all of those kind of processes that interact on hierarchical scales. So the natural complexity can be there but can also shift through time in that big, broader complexity, the nested one that brings in the socio-ecological system as well. And then the expression of that can also shift temporally as different parts of the phase space are explored, but it allows for all those different processes if you think in 4D type of space, time and, and 3D space, you've got the non-linearity. So it's, it's actually the dynamic properties of the system in the true, com well, in what was my background's complexity science definitions about what makes a complex system. Thanks very much, Beth. That's all we've got time for at the moment. So I'd like to ask everyone to join me in thanking Beth before we move to the next speaker. Thank you.